Deb Crow, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm so excited that we get to finally meet and finally have this conversation. We scheduled originally for uh, several months ago and had to reschedule. And it's just been, you know, we're both busy and it's been a hard time getting together. But uh, today we're going to have the opportunity to finally have that conversation and focus on heart-centered leadership, which I think is just a really powerful framing uh, for a whole bunch of principles that we'll unpack and explore together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Deb's bio with everybody. Deb Crow is an executive and business coach. She has 30 years, 30 plus years of global experience in top Fortune 500 companies in Canada, the United States, Europe, Asia, and Australia leading and coaching C-suite leaders, executive and senior management professionals, and their teams. Deborah's goal is to help people and organizations create an experience they envision and coach them to achieve their dreams, goals, and aspirations. I love that. I think that's wonderful. We need more and more of that in the world today. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background before we launch on in? I think I'd just like to add that I, I think sometimes we land up doing things in life that are unplanned. And I had started my career in disability management and looking after people who were hurt or traumatized or injured or lost and landed up making a big transition 11 years ago into the coaching world. So sometimes I think people see barriers as a negative thing. And I, I always see a barrier as an opportunity staring us in the face. Yeah, I like that perspective. And the reality is we all have a zigzagging path. I, I, I know very few people who have a, just a straight linear kind of progression path in life. You know, most of us um, really zigzag all the way around and, and we learn and we grow and we fall flat on our face and we pick ourselves back up and then we try again. And, and that takes us in all sorts of unique and interesting paths. Some really hard and others really uh, awesome. And, and ultimately though, that's, I think that's humanity. That's what life is all about. And, and so I think it's great that you found yourself in this space doing this type of work. So as we get started, uh, maybe you can share with us what you mean by heart-centered leadership. Like, what does that mean to you? And then we can start to unpack some of the principles there. It is my favorite thing to talk about. Heart-centered leadership to me is simple. It is honoring your connection with people. Yeah, that is pretty simple. <laughs> um, I, and I think of, you know, some, some of the most impactful books that I've read, um, you know, in my adult life. And, you know, there, there's so many books on leadership. There are so many books on, on motivation and helping people achieve their potential and what I, I see the common thread in all of those that have been most impactful to me is that in each of them, we honor the genuine, authentic individual that is in front of us. The, one author put it as, we honor the, other, the otherness of the other. Um, so we don't otherize other people to like put people into boxes and to like say, my tribe is better than your tribe. That's not what this author was talking about. We, we honor like the unique, um, the uniqueness of each individual, um, and they are who they are, and and we don't need to put them into a box. We just we just love them, we care for them, we support them, we honor them, and so I, I think the way you frame that is, is perfect. And it really doesn't need to get more complicated than that. Um, but that's easier said than done, right? Especially when you're in a business, you're leading an organization. There's all sorts of complexity. There's all sorts of uncertainty. There's the daily grind. Um, there's the pressures, the challenges that you face and we're all human. And so we're not perfect and we don't always respond the way that, you know, we probably hope we would. Um, so with that said, like, how do we do this? How do we start moving down more of a heart centered leadership approach? We have to embrace our imperfections and we have to look at our connection with people similar to something that you would do without being asked like bake cupcakes for a bake sale or volunteer somewhere, doing something that you want to do that makes you feel good so that your heart and your head are aligned. You made a really great point. Most leaders have so much on their plate every day and they have lives just like you and I. And then you stir in the pandemic and it just exacerbates everything. 
So when you can have a connection with people, whether it's in your personal life or your work life, and you're really present in the moment, like living in the now, attentive listening, not listening to respond, and it's not transactional. It's the connection. It's that heart and head alignment. That's how you can bring more heart centeredness into your life, into your work and let go of the expectation because we don't live in a perfect world. And I think when you embrace imperfection, that's how you really progress. Yeah. Because I mean, really it's, it's perfection is a facade. Like it, it's, it's not real. <laughs> um, no one can achieve perfection. I suppose in little tiny slivers of specific areas in our lives, we might be able to, to approximate perfection. Um, but life as a whole is messy. It's complex. It's nuanced. And, you know, I've, I don't know of anyone who's gotten even close to what I would consider, um, perfection, but I know lots of people who have lived really compelling, really meaningful, impactful lives. Of course they have their flaws. Of course they have their shortcomings. Um, the question isn't whether or not we have those. The question is, are we going to be self-reflective enough to recognize them and to work towards improving in, in areas that are um, pulling us down, drawing, uh, uh, undermining our ability to be effective with those around us? And, and ultimately, if we can just acknowledge that and then get away from like this, this false expectation of, of trying to, to uh, get to perfection, we can be authentic with who we are, grow into ourselves, be, feel comfortable, more comfortable with who we are. Um, and then that only then will that allow us to like actually be compassionate and empathetic with others around us who are also equally as imperfect, <laughs> equally flawed. Um, but I, I'm a true believer in the the common good in most people i think most people want to do right by others most people want to be good um most people want to help those around them most people want their to have a successful career and to help their organization uh and so if we can start from a a, a place a starting assumption that people are good uh that people want to contribute in meaningful ways that people aren't just trying to get away with stuff all the time, trying to do as little as possible, then we can be with them differently. We can approach them in our leadership differently in such a way um, that we show that we trust them, that, we, that we're gonna empower them and support them. And lo and behold, when as a leader, I approach my people that way, they act differently than if I approach them and, and um, if I be with them from a perspective of, you're a lazy employee, you're gonna get try to get away with anything you possibly can. I have to watch you like a hawk to make sure that you're not taking advantage of the company, blah, 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 right? All the other stuff that, um, that we know is kind of a common narrative in a lot of organizations with a lot of leaders and a more of a command control, uh, authoritarian kind of leadership approach or organizational culture. That, that style, that culture, I question if it was ever really uh, effective, but certainly, in, in the current knowledge economy, um, it, it just doesn't serve us. It, it doesn't, it's not gonna help your organization attract and retain good people. It's not gonna help you be innovative. It's not gonna help you get the most out of your people and you know uh, maximize the potential of your people. And ultimately it's gonna undermine your own you know, ability to be effective as a leader, which I would define as you know, effective leadership is helping your people uh, to fulfill their potential to bring value to the market and add value to the organization. And if that's what I'm trying to accomplish, the best surefire way to go about doing that is, is to lean on the expertise of my people, to develop mutual you know, relationships of mutual accountability of trust, mutual accountability and trust, and to create a psychologically safe workplace environment where people feel seen, they feel heard, they feel like they have the ability to contribute in meaningful ways daily. Um, when that kind of an environment is established, then the sky's the limit in what we can all accomplish. And that doesn't mean I have to set aside all the metrics and all of like the, the, um, the outcomes that I want to see from my team, but it, it just means I'm starting from a different starting point. Uh, I, I, I have a different foundational assumption about how I'm going to approach my people. And that leads to just completely different types of stronger outcomes. It does. Absolutely. There's a lot to unpack there. 
I think people try too hard. And one of the strategies that I've used with COVID because of being on Zoom and not everyone was working from home, some people were working with a hybrid workflow depending on the sector and where they are in the world. Sometimes a simple strategy as turning off your camera and closing your eyes when someone's talking. And when you do that, you're able to really interpret and hear not only the words and the expression of that person, but the emotion that's behind it. And it's almost like we need to stop and listen more and go back to that connection, that anchored connection, so that a person doesn't feel that the relationship is transactional. And that can be done. And I see it so much with nonverbal communication more than I do regular communication. So if we can focus and be cognizant to self audit that people see through real connectivity versus someone who's falsely trying to be connecting when they're not, the, the nonverbal cues will always give you away. They will. And you, you said it now a, a couple times, um, that genuine, authentic connection with other human beings is not a transactional kind of a relationship, right? Um, now, is it good to have reciprocity in mind? Like if I'm, if I'm going to go interact with other people um, and I'm only taking from them, that's unsustainable. So from my point of view, I want to be with other people and have reciprocity um, to establish meaningful, sustainable relationships, but I can't control what other people do. And so when I think about reciprocity, I, that's coming from my end, meaning if someone's giving me something, I'm going to make sure that I give them something in return. And it, if it doesn't go the other way, you know, that's not in my control. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to focus on that, but I'm going to focus on how I can give and, and, and support other people. Um, so if it, with that kind of said as a caveat, now I can set that aside and now I can just focus on genuine, authentic connection with my people being with them in the moment, mindfulness, um, being present, truly listening, uh, not, not with an agenda, but just listening to be there and be supportive when I can do that with my team and, you know, demonstrate authentic empathy for my people in the challenges that they're facing, the very real things that are happening in their personal lives, um, the challenges, the frustrations, the health issues, the mental health issues, whatever, when I can do that and just show genuine support, uh, it, it's, it's amazing how quickly you can establish those relationships of trust with your people. And it's that foundational relationship of trust that ultimately is going to lead towards that healthy workplace environment, that psychologically safe environment, and will unlock the potential of people to be creative and innovative. If you don't have that trust, then creativity and innovation usually doesn't really happen that much um, because people don't feel safe. They don't feel like they can, you know, innovation by definition is new, right? So you have to get outside of the status quo. You have to challenge boundaries. You have to challenge um, the status quo and, and, and do things in new ways that nobody's ever done it before. That's not uh, a comfortable place to be if you're in a psychologically unsafe place, right? So you have to build trust. The best surefire way to do that is just to set agendas aside and just be with people, listen, care, support, uh, and, and then it, it will happen naturally. Absolutely. And in terms of, you know, doing something and having it reciprocated, I always ask people to let it unfold organically. When you go in with your heart and head aligned, not everything has to be planned. And some relationships aren't supposed to have reciprocation. And that doesn't mean that you have lesser boundaries or don't implement boundary management into your life because that's a huge element of self-care, but not everything has to be transactional. It doesn't have to be, well, hey, I did this for you. What are you going to do for me? And where I see that creeping up in corporate America is 
people that have that from generational values, whether it's upbringing, remnants of a previous boss. So it's, it's a scenario that stays on repeat until someone calls that person on it and says, wait a minute, we don't do things like that here. That's not our vital, healthy culture. So I find there's remnants from a previous employer, or it, it, it can even be deep or visceral for some people, and it goes all the way back to their upbringing. So when you can break down that barrier, it makes heart-centered leadership easier to have a permanent residence within the workplace. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, so what, what do you see as maybe some of the, the other principles embedded in this idea of heart-centered leadership? We've already talked about mindfulness. We've talked about developing trust, um, seeing the authentic other, you know, there in front of you and, and being with them. Um, what, what other things do you see as important as we try to practice this heart-centered leadership approach? I developed a sketch note with a colleague of mine that I released in January and happy to give your listeners a free PDF download. We've had over 75,000 people worldwide download this. I've come up with 20 qualities that I believe heart-centered leaders possess, and it doesn't mean that they have it all on one time. It means you look and go, okay, these are my top three. These are the ones that I need to work at. So we work, we normally do a three to one ratio. It's great for conversation. It's great for team building. It's great when you have to get through a hard human capital conversation, but it allows organic vulnerability and authenticity from the leader when they can say, hey, Jonathan, here's my top three. And by the way, this is the one I'm working at. And a lot of times people will look at that person and say, you, because there's that perception because of title and stature that, you know, you've climbed that proverbial ladder and you know everything about everything and you're perfect, right? Because you have the fancy suit in the corner office. No, you're just a person, just like the person you're talking to and you are imperfect and you do make mistakes. But the fun thing is to not wallow in it and to have a laugh with your coworker and, and, and give them a story and let them know how you learned from it. So that, that sketch note has served a great purpose for a lot of leaders because I think we get so caught up in systems and protocols and rules and regulations that yeah. we land up being in this systematic way of thinking. And if you're going to honor your connection with people and be heart-centered, you need to be intrinsic in your thinking. Yeah, well, and the reality is so many systems have baked in inequities <laughs> and, and, and harms, you know, so, so we, I think we need systems are there for efficiency purposes, right? Uh, we develop them over time. Um, and, you know, sometimes they make sense. Sometimes they don't make sense. And a lot of times there are inequities baked in. And so we have to challenge those assumptions. We have to, you know, not just do something because it's always been done that way, but we have to be willing to dismantle, uh, unhealthy systems. Um, and, and so I think that goes into what you're saying, that if we just recognize the humanity of the person sitting in front of us, and we can see what challenges they're facing and what needs they have and, and how we can best support them, and it doesn't directly align with like what the current policy is or what the current system allows for, well, as a leader, you know, part of my job is to break down barriers for my people. <laughs> That's a big part of what I see as the job of a leader. Uh, and so that means you know, you got to push back and disrupt the system uh, and that there's no dogma around systems or dogma around policies. They're changeable. Um, they're, 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 they're not gospel, you know, like we need to change those things when they're not serving, um, you know, our people well. Uh, something else you just said that really resonated with me that I would, I would frame in terms of vulnerability. So for me as a leader, if, if I'm going to establish these meaningful, deep, interpersonal connections with the people around me and develop trust with my people, I have to be vulnerable with them. I have to model vulnerability for my people. Um, you know, I can say things about inclusion and I can say things about belonging and I can talk about um, empowerment and support and those sorts of things. All that's nice. But until I actually demonstrate how much I trust my people, because I'm now willing to be vulnerable in front of them and demonstrate my weaknesses and where, you know, the failures I've had in the past and what I've learned from those, um, that unlocks the, uh, 
the, it gives permission to my people now to do the same thing. Um, and, and it's natural, it's a natural human ten tendency when one person is vulnerable with another person, um, that, that, that next person will often then be more vulnerable back. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not like this reciprocity expectation that I'm vulnerable. So therefore you have to be vulnerable to me, but it's just, this, it's the, the human connection that unlocks that. And then once you do that, it just, it, you build meaning and, and, um, and trust. And that's how relationships are established. That's how we need to build uh, meaningful, uh, sustainable, ongoing relationships. Absolutely. It's, it's a process, but it doesn't have to be a process. If that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, and I like you've said several times that we can let things be organic. We can let them unfold, um, you know, the, the way they meant to unfold. And that doesn't mean we can't be proactive. That doesn't mean we can't, you know, have some sort of, um, you know, kind of a direction or a purpose behind what we're trying to accomplish. But it also means we have to be flexible enough to just, you know, be with people and be with ourselves where we're at and allow things to unfold. Well, Deb, it has just been a real pleasure. The time has flown by. Uh, I'll need to let you go here in just a moment. But before we close today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on uh, heart-centered leadership for today. Absolutely. So my website's Deb Crow. Crow has an E on the end. It just means I'm Irish.com. And heart-centered leadership belongs to everybody. You don't have to have initials after your name to be a leader. I've met leaders that are five years old to 95 years old. And when we let go of expectations, and you and I've talked about this in this amazing conversation today, and allow ourselves to be, that's where the magic happens. Well said. And it is magic when you have that authentic human connection. Uh, there's nothing better. Well, Deb, it has been a real pleasure. I appreciate all of your insights and wisdom that you've shared with me and my listeners today. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected with Deb, to find out more about what she and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.